And we are live, live, live. It is February 9th, 2015, and this is the very beginning of Responsible Travel Week 2015, chatting with good friend and uh, fellow person living in North America. Uh, Elena, can you introduce yourself? Hi, Ron. So my name is Elena. I, I'm from Russia, and I've been working with Russian protected areas for almost eight years, uh, mostly in developing ecological tourism, environmental education programs in Russia. Right now I'm in Montana in the United States because I just started my PhD program in protected area management, but my passion is still with Russian protected areas and I'm going to talk a little bit about this today. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Elena and I know, our, uh, know each other through the TAPAS group, and that's a tourism and protected area specialist group and hopefully we'll get some more TAPAS people participating this week and yes one of the major topics and talking points for responsible travel week is uh, are the parks and protected areas around the world we'll be looking at the biosphere reserves and the city parks and a quick a plug commercial plug for two friends in Oaxaca first of all we couldn't have responsible travel week without chocolate so <laughs> please uh, take a look at Choco Luchi the chocolate worth fighting for in Oaxaca Mexico, and a uh, wonderful friend, Lucia Diaz, makes this. And also uh, a shout out to the weavers of Ladi, the weavings of Teotitlan de Valle, a little village uh, around 17 kilometers outside of Oaxaca City, where many good friends are, are living and weaving their living. Zakshtu Shtuji Nubiu. Wow. Um, first off, let's talk travel and tourism. Uh, in, 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 in Russia, are there different words for travel and tourism? Yeah, well, we say tourism. This is the word for tourism. Travel, it's more путешествие. It's a little difficult word maybe for other people to understand, but uh, Responsible Travel Week we will translate as неделя устойчивого туризма. That's what it is in Russian, in case somebody in Russian is watching us right now. How would you translate sustainable travel week? Uh, that's actually will be also неделя устойчивого туризма. So the words would be the same? Yes, more or less. And what's the word for week? Неделя. See, what's interesting when we talk to our indigenous friends, uh, for the most part they don't have week because they don't have a seven-day calendar. Um, and travel also is, is problematic and don't even get me started on tourism. I mean, it's a word that really just doesn't uh, exist naturally or organically in many languages. So, <laughs> welcome. We're going to explore these topics. And uh, for those watching live, uh, yay. Thank you to our four viewers. Um, you are welcome to use that Q&A app. Mm -hmm. uh, Elena, technical note, we have uh, the option to receive questions from people. And uh, they're able to post that directly in our live hangout. And uh, I'd like to select the very first question, which goes to you. Thank you, Alistair McKenzie. Okay. Uh, excuse me, last name, Nikolaeva? Nikolaeva. Nikolaeva. So, yes. Elena Nikolaeva's presentation uh, with Polotovsky example suggests that to avoid public indifference and hostility towards protected areas, they have to relax rules, open up, and allow organized ecotourism. Correct? Did I read that right? He asks. Yes. Well, uh, because Russian protected areas were kind of closed for public for many years, they were mostly for biological diversity protection. Uh, people were actually not allowed to go inside, and that was great for the biodiversity, but in many cases it brought about some problems with local communities, sometimes, sometimes some hostile attitudes from local communities and right now in many protected areas of Russia a lot of work is being done to try to work with local communities, involve them in conservation activities, explain them why it is important and yeah, develop some responsible and sustainable ecotourism in our protected areas. Not everywhere, there are still very like key areas, important areas that people are not allowed to get into, but to some areas uh, we try, in some areas we try to develop ecological tourism and explain people why it is important to 
have this reserve, have this national park in this area, and what uh, what are the values of this? Can you give me a, a little bit, bit of a picture of the parks in Russia? Are they located near near major cities, or are they in the far off Russian hinterlands? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, Russia is a huge country, so we have different protected areas, uh, and. So as I wrote uh, in my presentation, we have 103 zapovedniks, which is uh, a special word, Russian word for strict nature reserves, uh, which uh, like the it equals category one international of international union of nature conservation protected area management categories, and so they sometimes are located in very remote areas. So if you look at the map of Russia. Uh, with the protected areas that I had in my presentation. You can see that they are actually everywhere. You can see some of them in the Far East, in Kamchatka area. This is the peninsula, a very beautiful, unique peninsula that we have. Uh, some of them are located close to big cities, like we have Priokska Terrasny uh, Zapovednik, which is quite close to Moscow. It's about like three hour drive from Moscow, which is very close. And three hour, wait a minute, a three hour drive is very close? I would say so. If you look at the map of Russia, <laughs> it's just it's very... like the whole country is West Texas or Western Australia. <laughs> yeah, well, because if I talk about Kamchatka and if I talk about Kranotsky Zapovednik, which, to, which in my opinion, one of the most beautiful Zapovedniks we have, it will be nine-hour plane uh, flight by Moscow from Moscow. So it's. Hey, we're late taking. A... <laughs> Sorry. Can you see this? Uh, we're looking at the. Uh... The slideshare presentation, or did I lose it? Oh uh, well, I I, I see. It. So what I'm saying is, you see the uh, the slideshare presentation, and anyone we have the link to this uh, on the hangout, and uh, this is Elena's presentation on on the tourism in Russian protected areas. Thank you yeah. so very much. So my whole idea is that we have a whole variety of protected areas, and Zapovedniks is our traditional form of nature protection. The first one was established in 1916 in Siberia, and this is the most strict protection. We also have 47 national parks. Uh, it's category two of uh, IUCN protected area management categories, and the first one was established in 1983, so it's not so old, but it's already also a very popular form of nature protection in our country and also almost 70 federal sanctuaries. And this is only federal level protected areas. We also have regional level protected areas, local level protected areas. So in general, about 12% of the country is protected right now. Let me ask you a question about the services in the parks. Are we talking that there are companies that go in and offer interpretation or guide services? Are there hotels in the parks? Uh, OK. What's so it's very different, and um, every national park and every zapovednik has uh, three main departments. So it's Department of Law Enforcement, Department of uh, Scientific Research, and Department of Environmental Education and Tourism. They can be separated, but uh, sometimes at the same department. And so mostly guided services in the parks, like environmental education, excursions, they are in most cases provided by the parks or zapovedniks themselves, but sometimes <clears throat> our protected areas collaborate with travel companies and sometimes uh, some excursions can be operated by travel companies and this is what, what is being done in Kamchatka. So for example, if you want to uh, book a tour to go to the Valley of Geysers, you have to turn to a special travel companies that cooperate with the Zapovednik and they will help you to do this. As for the hotels and big services, uh, well, sometimes we do have some maybe guest houses, but no, there are not huge tourism industry in the parks and maybe this is for the best, that's what I think, because in, in my opinion they should be located not within the boundaries of protected areas. No doubt you've seen a number of changes uh, in tourism in the past 20 years. Uh, I'm kind of wondering about the timeline. Uh, you say that uh, the, art, the parks were at first kind of areas just for biological diversity and people were certainly not welcome. When did that policy start changing? Well, uh, I think it's in the late 1990s um, when many protected areas realized that actually um, 
It was really great for the biodiversity, and thanks to our protected areas, a lot of species were saved from being extinct, like Amur tigers, snow leopard, bears, even beavers. Uh, so many, many, many uh, species were saved from being extinct because of that. But uh, in some situations in Siberia, for example, in the European part of Russia, uh, we could see this really bad attitude from local communities. Many of them could not understand why protected areas existed because they were excluded from their traditional land use activities. And so I would say that in the late 1990s um, there were some people um, who started to promote this idea that we should focus more on environmental education and try to explain people, local communities, visitors, just public uh, about the values of protected areas. So why was it closed for the public? And a lot of this uh, actually uh, was initiated by the company called Environmental Education Center, and this is the company, a non-government organization where I have been working for eight years, and uh, my director, Natalia Danilina, she's actually a member of TEPAS group too, so she worked in the ministry for a long time, and then she this organization with a special aim to promote environmental education and later ecological tourism. Tourism started to develop in already in this century and uh, in 200, maybe like three, four, five. So, yep. <laughs> what is that? Uh, it's a notebook. Everyone has their notebook. Uh, what's the name of the center again? Environmental Education Center. It's a non-government organization uh, where it's, it's a small one. We have about 10 people there, but all of them are very passionate about conservation and about uh, activities, um, about actually protecting nature and about environmental education and ecotourism right now. All right, here's my social web query for you. Does the center have a Facebook page? Uh, yes, it does, and I'm going to promote this too. Um, so all right, well, let's, let's run, run down. Does it have uh, Twitter? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no. Does, does, it have, does it have Instagram? No, no, wrong. <laughs> we are not this technically advanced so far, but we are getting into it. That's, that's no problem. All right, so right now it's, it's, uh, it has a website and a Facebook page, right? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, that, this, is, you know, this is how we kickstart 2015. We, uh, we find people on Facebook and get them onto Twitter. Uh, it's kind of a rescue operation. Um, seriously, uh, you know, the, what is Responsible Travel Week? We do take very seriously the substance and the content of ethical travel and biodiversity conservation and indigenous rights and uh, a whole slew of, you know, the, the aspirations that, that we hold. And at the same point, we say, how are we going to use this new technology? And hopefully we'll use it in, in wise and clever, clever ways. Uh, anyway, I'll go into more in detail about what Responsible Travel Week is, since it is Monday, and we are, you know, either talking to the converted and talking to people who really haven't heard of these issues. And if they have, they may have uh, set ideas. And one of the goals of this is to kind of uh, bust it open and you know create this revolution long sought for for people who believe in responsible travel. So, yay. Um, selecting another question from our Q&A in bag, and anyone can post a question. Um, Alistair is asking another question. Uh, help me out with the pronunciation. That was Zapodeknas. Zapovednik, right. You're doing a great job. Hold on. Slow it, slow it down. We'll say it again. Zapovednik. 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 <laughs> Okay, what she said, and he asks, uh, are, they in, are, are all of them engaging with tourism, and uh, are some of them resisting? No, definitely not all of them. So right now, uh, well, there are many people who are against this idea that there should be some kind of tourism, responsible, sustainable tourism, doesn't matter, but there are some people who are totally opposed to this idea and say that, still say that uh, the main focus of Zapovedniks is biodiversity protection. <coughs> and I have some really good friends that actually have this idea in mind. Uh, but uh, like my opinion is that definitely the main goal is biodiversity protection, and we should definitely always keep in mind what is the main role of a zapovednik. But at the same time, 
I realized that the, without public support and without explaining people what it is all for, it would be very, very difficult to develop. So coming back to your questions, uh, our ministry, uh, we have some guidance like manual from the ministry, all our protected areas, what they should focus on. They said uh, they say that they should be focus on environmental education tourism everywhere but of course it should be very dependent on the specific situation on the specific protected area and it should be developed in a very different way uh, depending on where you do this so for some areas it could be like more people and to more places that they can go in some other areas it should be very 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 limited and we also should always should keep in mind these words sustainable responsible it's definitely not a mass tourism and it will never be mass tourism so in Zapovetnik it's only somewhere in some areas uh, and the main idea is education educate people and through the education actually grow this public support and appreciation that's that's what I'll say about that what, what about well, excellent and well, well said. Uh, what about the communities themselves that don't want tourism? Uh, are they opting out? Well, if, this is very interesting question. So, uh, I was lucky to be involved in a uh, social research in Kamchatka. I did research there two seasons uh, in 2012 and 2013. And we had a project where we interviewed local communities uh, and visitors about their attitude towards tourism development in the whole area, uh, in the protected area, in the whole region. And we asked about their attitudes, like what do they think? Should tourism be developed here? Uh, what are the benefits? How do you see the benefits? What are the limitations? Uh, what should be changed so that you have some benefits from that? And there were very different answers. We got really very interesting and different responses from people and so the majority of people actually local communities I'm talking about local communities now they realize that tourism responsible tourism can bring certain benefits to them personally to the whole area like for example they can uh, get some alternative livelihoods for example uh, and we have this problem of poaching in many areas and I'll talk more about this later so uh, and for many people uh, be involved in tourism and be have this opportunity to work as guides for example or provide some bed and breakfast services it's actually a way to earn some money and some people just become proud that they're areas are well known if people want to come and experience that. On the other hand, there are some people who are totally opposed to this idea and while I was telling you right now this um, the things about my research, some quotes came into my mind and I remember that one lady was talking that tourism always it brings just garbage and bad people and we don't want this at all. So there are some people who are still totally opposed to this. And, for example, in Palestorsky Reserve, this is a case study that I was referring to in my presentation, um, I know that in the beginning it was very, very different, difficult to develop any types of ecotourism there because people simply did not, uh, local communities, see a lot of people coming in and if we, have, if we had, for example, a couple of groups coming during summer, that was definitely not enough income for them. And they, it took like two, three years for local people to realize that actually they can have some benefits, but at the beginning they perceived it as something that they didn't want to deal with. So to, I think it, it will just take time, sometimes a lot of time, many years, maybe decades, to uh, make it really sustainable and to make people interested and to show them that they can actually really benefit from that. Again, well said, well said. And, uh, Alistair, many thanks for some fine, provocative questions to, to begin the day with. <laughs> I like provocative questions. Oh, this is great. Uh, I want to do a, a little segue and, um, and explain to uh, Elena and to uh, our audience here what, about Responsible Travel Week. And you know, again, Elena, if you have any questions, you know, you're more than welcome to, to shout them out. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of a, the history of Responsible Travel Week. And all of this information is here on Planeta.com and the Planeta Wiki in particular. The Wiki is a page of, of community co-editing and this is the information hub for Responsible Travel Week. And there's a lot of information 
Um, but basically, it has a, it has your links to uh, the Eventbrite registration, as well as the event pages on Facebook and Google, and the announcement on LinkedIn, and on and on. But if we click this one link, it says the agenda slash calendar. This has uh, the challenges and the contest for today, as well as a link to the Hangout and the archived uh, video on YouTube. When people do use the RT Week 15 hashtag and they post a, a link about responsible travel, where we're curating and, and harvesting those links and we're posting that on elsewhere on the web. Also, a special shout out today to our friends on Flickr. Uh, that's Marcus Bauer at Respond Tour. That's Deborah McLaren, and that's Ivar Rukel, aka Suma from the Suma National Park in Estonia. So there is no one place, one room for Responsible Travel Week. It occurs like a major conference in various uh, informa information halls or, or trade show salons, uh, and those are in fact the social web channels. So yes, we do have an event page on Facebook. We do have an event page on Google Plus, and for the people who are passionate about responsible travel or for the people who are curious about responsible travel. This is an excellent page to come to uh, on a daily basis during responsible travel week and you know we'll link to uh, everything else out there. So that's your <clears throat> little tidbit of what is responsible travel week. You know we started this back uh, seven years ago when I was invited to a conference in Belize but thanks to you know our friend Swine Flu uh, the conference was canceled at the very last minute. And so I told Harold Goodwin, well, you know, we're supposed to go to Belize, but we can't. Why don't we do this online? I've had a history of hosting online conferences since the year 2000 with North American ecotourism. And that you know, just made an easy segue to do uh, a responsible travel week. So we've been doing that ever since. And uh, a big shout out to our friends uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. They're hosting flash mobs uh, throughout the week and a very special seminar on Wednesday at the Two Oceans Aquarium. Our friends in London are hosting a, a networking and cocktail hour in, in London with RT Unite. Um, if there's anything else out there, please let us know. I'm scheduling a, a dogs and drone a visit to Sunset Park in Las Vegas on Friday. So mm -hmm. people will be making announcements and doing things on the ground. Um, otherwise, it's online, and we encourage you to um, to take a look at these different channels. And if it works out for you to join them, you know, if you're on Flickr, you know, please add a star, add a heart, add a star to the to the to the to the poster or to the photo. If you're on Facebook, you know, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you're on SlideShare, oh, please give it a heart and and like the presentation. All of this stuff contributes, and we will be talking up responsible travel. So you know, why not? Elena, any questions or comments? No, I'm just very thankful to Ron for initiating all that, and I think it's a great resource for those people who want to know more about tourism and sustainable and responsible tourism in protected areas and in general. I think it's just a great opportunity to meet some people and be involved in, and just ask some questions, and uh, I hope I'll have some time this week and participate in more Hangouts and just I'm looking forward to listen to other people and just I think it's a great opportunity to know more about this topic so thank you very much Ron for that. Okay. It, it's you know it, it, it's a way of giving back. Um, 1F is now 20 years old and the work that I've been doing in this field and it just made sense to do something really inclusive and really public and also kind of on the cutting edge of technology. Doesn't yeah. It, doesn't, you know, please thank you that the Hangouts and the YouTube um, you know very you know, accessible to use, very free to use. Uh, well, why not again? Hey, we have some more questions just popping in from from Alistair, so let's just kind of take him. Um, well, he says, Wisconsin Tourism Federation is a dogs and drone trip. Well, basically, I'm still scheduling the uh, trip to one of the city parks in Las Vegas, Alistair, and we're going to go to one of the older parks in the city called Sunset and basically invite people to bring their dogs and if they have a drone, bring a drone. Uh, we'll learn how to fly them and, and uh, do some videography with the drones. If you haven't seen the introductory video that I've recorded, uh, again, I'll add that link. But my nephew Kevin, a drone fiend, uh, helped record some of the videos from the city parks here. So we're going to have that here in Vegas. So um, tell your friends in Vegas to, 
to go to a city park to celebrate Responsible Travel Week. Uh, and on a side note, I love Sunset Park. It has some beautiful signs talking about the biodiversity of the Mojave Desert. And I'm a big, big fan of the pocket parks and the city parks uh, in these urban areas. And when they can have environmental education, yes, I take photos of it and I read it and I'm a plaque lover. Uh, great to hear about you know local biodiversity. So thank you, Alistair. Uh, this is, these are questions being posted in the Q&A app. Another question, uh, going back to Elena's uh, point, the, uh, is there an imbalance um, among the protected areas, uh, i.e., Polosovsky is a marsh. Does it attract as, many, as much interest among birders as another protected area with, say, birds? Sure. Well, there's a big imbalance, of course, and Polosovsky Zapovednik. It's actually uh, it's located very close to European border, and it's a huge wetland area. It's a raised bog area, so it's marshes, uh, raised bog everywhere. And so the main challenge for for us when we were working, and many people are working now on developing ecotourism, is try to make people interested in that. So what is interesting about the raised bog? So why one should second, I? One second. One second. How do you say bog in Russian? Valota. So how do you make people interested in that? In <laughs> this is a great question. Because, yeah, really, what is special about the bog? Like, why should I actually bother come all the way from Moscow, from St. Petersburg, or even from other countries, from the United States of America? Why should I bother just to come and see this bog? But, so that was the main challenge, to how to explain people uh, what is really special about this. What are the main values of this huge wetland area? And so you would be probably very surprised that there are only, uh, like three years ago, I would say there were just 100, maybe 50 people per year that visited this protected area. I know it sounds funny in comparison with many American protected areas that are visited by millions of people. Uh, but that was our main challenge, and uh, the challenge of uh, like how to really make people interested and come there. So Polisovsky Reserve uh, Director and his team, what they did, so they built a small visitor center uh, in the village so that people can come and learn more about the values of a raised bog area. They made several environmental education trails, like environmental trails, one that goes in the bog, another one that goes in the forest, and also a boat route, route, so that people can go with the guide, and the guide would explain people what is special about this area. And yes, coming back to the questions, there are many people that are interested in birds who come there, and uh, with the birds, it's always it's tricky because you cannot predict if there will be lots of birds and some bird watchers uh, can be happy because they see a lot of birds. Other time it can be a little tougher. But yeah, there are some people who are interested in birds and come there and this is one of our target audience there. Uh, and I was talking about this Palota, about this raised bog area. In this situation, there are some other protected areas that have absolutely different focus, like in Kamchatka, with the volcanoes and uh, geysers, it's absolutely different people uh, that come there, and uh, not bird watchers, but and there are many more people that come there. So yeah, there are very, very different protected areas in our country, and each protected area has its own challenges, and there should be a special focus how to attract people and uh, make it interesting and responsible. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Does the Park Service itself um, have photos of, of the national parks online? And as so we have, any of these social websites? Yeah, so we have a, a Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Environment that is in charge of our protected areas. I mean, there is a special department, Department of uh, Protected Areas there. And um, so in comparison with American, America, it's a National Park Service. It's a much bigger organization. So in, in the ministry, we have much less people, but uh, yes, they manage our protected areas, uh, federal level protected areas, and they have a website. I will send you a link for this website. 
Um, and definitely they have information and interactive map about each protected area, federal level protected area, with pictures, with general information. I'm not sure right now how much information is in English, but I'm sure there, is some, there are some resources where you can find information in English, and this is something that we need to work more on. But anyway, in Russian, there are lots of information about um, like general info and how to get there and what is the focus, what they protect, what... Uh, like where they are located, and of course pictures. Beautiful. We'll take a look at that. And uh, you know, I'm a big, big fan of the of the websites like uh, Instagram as well as uh, Flickr. Uh, Flickr, we have um, uh, an index of the rural parks using Flickr. Uh, right now, it's a list that has mostly U.S. parks. Uh, the the U.S. parks just in the past uh, six years have really adopted the the use of social channels. So mm -hmm. they have their own uh, um, Twitter account, or they have their own Flickr page. Um, I've been creating calendars each month using the Creative Commons attributed uh, photos from the national parks. And again, I think there's one, one wonderful thing about photography is that you can read the photo in any language. So if we can track down some photos, again, it, it doesn't matter what the, what the language is, uh, you can see more or less uh, you can see the the environment, or you can see the animals, and um, you know translation services can carry you further. But that photo, it's all about you know to me, it's about visual thinking. You know what does responsible travel look like? And you know many thanks to the people who post photos on Facebook or or elsewhere that show irresponsible tourism. You know are people you know missing the garbage can? Uh, are they you know? Are they, you know, being irresponsible? Well, then let's see photos and denounce those practices. But oh, photos, photos, photos. Uh, taking one more question here um, from Alistair. Thank you again. Uh, selecting it, the tourist and wildlife enthusiasts tend toward the big ticket items. Um, so what are the biggies in Russia? Uh, you have know, the snow leopard. Uh, Anything else we should be aware of as your big, uh, adorable wildlife? Sure, uh, more tigers. And actually, uh, this week is 80-year anniversary of Sikhatyalinsky Biosphere Reserve, Zapovednik, which is in the far east of Russia. And this is the reserve that uh, protects Amur tigers. And is, uh, Amur tigers? What was that? Say that again, Amur tigers? Amur tigers. Amur tigers, yeah. This is one of the most like charismatic species that we have, and they do a great job to protect it from being extinct. There are not many individuals that are left uh, right now in the wild, and uh, so taking this opportunity, I want to uh, say happy birthday to Sikhatyalinsky Reserve right now. <laughs> so, and they have they have they're quite active um, on social media, so they do have a Facebook page that is updated quite regularly. I'll send you a link for sure, and it's. I think it's, I hope it's both in English and in Russian, and, and uh, so definitely more tigers. We have a bunch of other like really charismatic species like uh, you said snow leopards. I, I don't know. I know all of them in English, but <laughs> so we have. I can send you some links about uh, our mammals and wildlife, like wildlife in general. Actually, bears in Kamchatka. Uh, well, bears are not maybe. Everybody know them, but uh, Kamchatka species, they are a little different. Um, we don't call them grizzlies, although they are kind of related. And uh, this is the, like, South Kamchatka century is a place with the largest concentration of brown bears on Earth. So this is something also unique that we have. And uh, yeah, I can talk more about that. I don't know if we have time about uh, to talk more about our wildlife. Well, that's just beautiful, Alistair. I hope your your questions have been answered, and and just those were those were a series of doozies. Thank you so so very much. Um, oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, we will talk more about Russia, and we will talk more about the wildlife, and we will talk more about parks. But I want to uh, do a, a sideways shout shout out. What about food? Uh, where have you experienced good examples of uh, that that local foodie connection and travel? Is it a question about Russia? It's a question about Russia. It's a question about anywhere. Connect food and travel to. So yeah, 
for example, coming back to the example that I was uh, referring to in my presentation, Polistovsky Nature Reserve, Polistovsky Zapovednik, that, that's the more correct word in Russian. So when we started to work with local communities, uh, and so what they are involved in right now, so they are cooking food for tourists. So there is this guest house where tourists can stay overnight, a couple of nights when they come visit this area, and the food is provided by local people. And so the main idea was that uh, they should cook authentic, like Russian food, uh, something that is special for this area, and this is what makes it also interesting for people to come. And uh, there are like two two people, like mostly one woman who is most of the time working with tourists and cooks food, and she every time makes it really interesting for people not only to eat but to know more about this food. Uh, she, she will tell you a story about this. Some food is being prepared in the Russian stove, like it's a very traditional um, stove and people heated their houses with the stove and cooked food and sometimes even uh, little children can be washed in this stove. So it's a whole bunch of traditions associated with that. So. A meal in this case uh, is not only food, but something uh, through which people can know more about the culture and traditions of the land. And this is that was one of the ideas while developing tourism and uh, trying to involve local communities is to make it interesting and to make it authentic and to make it really a great experience for people. So I think that food is and travel can be very much connected, and I think it's just obvious when you come. And when you travel to a different country, uh, when you travel to a different region, you want to know more about cultural traditions, and through the food you can do it. That's. Are you thinking of a particular cook that that you met on, at this park? Particular. Uh, you are, mean you a particular are you thinking of a particular lady when you're talking about yes, how, she, exactly. how she does it so well? Mm -hmm. What's her name? Uh, Zinaida Petrovna. <laughs> You're making that up. I actually, in my presentation, I have a picture of her. So, uh, if you go to my slides, uh, there will be a slide uh, when you have this picture of the table and people eating there. And so she was in the center of the picture, and she is cooking almost all the time for people. There, there are other people, and we try to involve more people in these activities. But when I was talking about food, I mostly had her in mind, and she's great. She's absolutely great. It's definitely worth coming there and trying her food. Oh, that's just beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, that's great. Are there any questions out there in the peanut gallery the people who are watching our, our day number one of the Responsible Travel Hangout? Um, I'm looking on Twitter and not seeing any uh, Twitter questions right now. Um, so here's our, here's our goal for uh, Responsible Travel Week. Uh, we're going to be doing these hangouts on, uh, Monday through Friday at the very same time. We will arrange other hangouts later this uh, later this month at other times that are more mutually beneficial uh, for folks, and we will get this discussion going um, on the YouTube video. You are more than welcome to post comments. You are more than welcome to like it or, or share it. And if you have uh, an interest in participating on camera for one of the hangouts later this week, please let me know. Uh, there is no um, you know, formal inauguration or closure of Responsible Travel Week. Hopefully, it is a responsible travel year for you, and hopefully, we'll find ways of again, you know, really finding the best. Because uh, to me, it's about um, <laughs> making this as uh, as as inclusive and as po and as fun as possible. I'm just chuckling because we have one more question from Alistair. As soon as he can type it out, um, Elena, any other comments over there? No, I, I'm just thankful for your attention, and um, as I said, it, it's a great opportunity, this Responsible Travel Week. I'm going to tell my Russian colleagues about that, and hopefully they will participate in this too. Maybe some would like to be recorded too, so I think it's a great, great opportunity for exchanging experience and just knowing each other, those people who are passionate about protected areas and conservation and responsible tourism. You know, what I'd like to see is, uh, is like a glossary of maybe like the top Ten or twenty words in Russian that are related to the parks, because I'm sure if there's this word, there's there are others, and you know, okay. we can create you know this this uh, very short kind of um, a list of, of keywords. Um, 
I'll, I'll send it to you. Please do, please do. And and Elena, you're more than welcome to uh, post any of the you know, specific links uh, uh, on this Google Hangout as well as on the Facebook event page or the Google Plus event page. You know, okay. The, the old way of doing it was, you know, in you know, the old way of doing it, and back in '94, '95, when I created Planeta, was that you know people had email and that was it, and they would send me stuff. I would process it and I would again publish it and put it out there for, for consumption and people would, again would write to me directly and make a correction or make a submission and I would again publish and what's really nice about the social web is that you, know, you have an access right now to get your word out to talk up institutions if this if any of these centers are you know, centers institution tourism businesses you know they might have a Facebook page and share it let us know about it and okay this is where we get this big explosion of, of information and knowledge. All right, I'm uh, squinting, so I must be reading a question from Alistair. Um, are, you, are you seeing signs of international specialist tour operators beginning to bring wildlife travel, wildlife uh, enthusiasts to the protected areas in Russia? Are the international companies coming in? Well, this is also one of the challenges for our protected areas right now to gain more attention from international communities, and that was one of the goals uh, of our participation at the World Parks Congress in Australia in November 2014. We brought a big delegation from Russia, almost 50 people working in different protected areas. So our idea was try to present our protected areas to the international community. So we had a big exhibition about Russian wildlife, about Russian protected areas. We initiated five side events on different topics about Kamchatka, Baikal, about transboundary protected areas, cultural landscapes, marine protected areas. So we just really wanted people to know that we have this unique potential. We have really unique nature in Russia and we're welcome, uh, so we're open for cooperation. We welcome international organizations to come and cooperate with us. Uh, they're not too many international traveling uh, international visitors right now only to some areas for example to Kamchatka it's quite well known already and many international companies work with uh, with it and bring their tourists but for example Polistovsky uh, strict nature reserve Zaporizhia it's not that well known and so there are not too many international visitors, but this is something that we're working on and all our protected areas are very open for cooperation and we would love to see more international visitors coming to our protected areas. Beautiful. Uh, isn't there an international bog day? Or when yeah, it's celebrate? like Wednesday, 2nd of February. Actually, it, it already passed. <laughs> yes, it was 2nd of February. February well, that's World. Wednesday, but I think bogs have their own special bog day. But we'll, we'll, I don't know. I know. I know that these. Th this is like Wetlands Day, International Wetlands Day, the second of February. I should ask if there's any Bog Day. Maybe. Maybe we should create one. <laughs> I don't know. We should talk about this with those people who are passionate about bogs and wetlands in general. Any other events we want to give a shout out, promote uh, in the coming year? Uh, well, we have our 100th anniversary of protected areas in Russia. Actually, um, so the whole. It's actually it will be in 2017. So uh, right now all our protected areas and the ministry they are kind of getting ready to this year because because it will be a big year and really it's a great event 100th anniversary of our federal level protected areas. So and we will definitely post information and events about this year uh, and of course that would be a great opportunity for many international visitors come and see our places our really unique places that we have in Russia. Beautiful. You have 2016 as the centennial for parks in the in United States. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Uh, we'll see all sorts of good things. Uh, kind of a just highlight that on uh, March 3rd is World Wildlife Day. Mm -hmm. we'll be paying attention to that. Uh, in March, there is Open Education Week. On June 5th is World Environment Day. In August, uh, we're going to be launching our next, fifth round of Indigenous Peoples Week, and on September 27th is World Tourism Day. So hopefully we'll be adding some items to the calendar and letting people know what's happening, and um, as I say, make this a, a responsible travel year.
-hmm. So, you know, and I'm very excited that we're uh, starting this week with a good discussion about uh, about parks and protected areas in Russia because, well, frankly, on this side, you know, on this side of the Atlantic or the Pacific, um, you know, we don't ever hear about parks and protected areas in other countries, particularly Russia. So I'm glad that we could get that out. Any question that you may have, I would be happy to answer after the Hangout as well. So just write me and I will address some questions to my colleagues. And as I said, we're very open to cooperation and just want to make our areas accessible to other people so that they come and experience this unique nature that we have. Couldn't be better. Couldn't be finer. All right, Elena, we're going to wind down the Hangout at this point. This conversation will continue. Uh, Elena and I uh, are very proud members of the Tapas organization. And for those uh, professionals working with parks and tourism, please, you know, have a look at the Tapas wiki page and contact Elena, who's in charge of the membership uh, of the organization. So, oh, this could continue for for a while, but uh, we'll wrap it up here. And thank you everybody for watching. As I say, uh, please um, like and share and comment, and we'll continue this conversation. Elena, um, спасибо. Спасибо, пожалуйста. <laughs>